There's a scene late in the fifth season of The Sopranos that not only foreshadows Tony's demise, but cuts to the heart of what the show is all about. Tony is talking to Carmela on the phone. I had one of my Coach Bolanero dreams. Later on, he asks her, Is it daylight where you are? She's a few miles west of him, and so he would see the sunrise before her. It's something you might say if you were talking just to talk. They shoot the shit for a little while longer. Is that us the house next door, Barker? Can you hear him? Absolutely. 5.30 in the morning. Someone ought to serve him some veal. A lot of strict lang. Stop it. I'm serious. Is it light where you are yet? If you don't recall this abrupt cut to black, there's no doubt you'll remember another. It's the last shot of the entire show. Not really a shot at all. It's nothingness. Void. A moment of shock, disappointment, sadness, awe. If we look back to that phone conversation, we have something that we didn't get at the end. We have Tony's voice. Is it light where you are yet? If one watches the ending again and thinks about that question, it could illuminate a very meaningful way to experience the show. I'm a fool to do your dirty work. Go, yeah. As the show progresses, we the viewers get closer and closer to Tony until in the final shot, we become him. We see the world as he sees it. We see Tony at his best, at his worst, and in the throes of spiritual emergency, asking the big questions that haunt good people. Mr. Soprano. Tony. What, honey? What? Where am I going? Whether someone really blew his brains out in that diner or not, His world is one kind of darkness or another. Who else other than the audience had the privilege of seeing Tony's world as he sees it? While she could hardly compete with the omniscient viewer, Dr. Melfi did get a good look at Tony. You know my feelings. Every day is a gift. It just doesn't have to be a pair of socks. Where did that long, hard look leave her? with one less patient. Remember that, influenced by her colleagues and motivated by industry literature, Dr. Melfi ultimately decides to end Tony's treatment once and for all. When the show ended in 2007, New York Magazine published an essay called The Long Con by TV commentator Emily Nussbaum. According to the article, David Chase and company spent the entire series conning us into adoring Tony only to reveal that Tony was merely a psychopath and, as such, immune to psychoanalytic methods of self-development. We were naive for ever believing Tony was anything other than purely evil, and our taste uncivilized for ever being amused by such a monster. Nussbaum's hypothesis was just plain wrong. First of all, if the writers were conning us all along, then why is it suddenly true that Tony is a psychopath? It seems especially odd to pick out this one fact as the truth when out of all of the ways in which we may have been misled, the writers seemed exceedingly eager to show us that Tony was not inherently evil. For instance, there's this scene. This short sequence reveals something profound about Tony's character. He can perceive that another person exists outside of the context in which he exists, the context in which he experiences that person. To him, Tracy is just a stripper. She is also someone's daughter, Tony understands, just like he has a daughter. This is basic human empathy, not a quality anyone would attribute to a psychopath. We also learn that Tony was shocked and traumatized the first time that he encountered brutal violence. Tony wasn't fascinated or amused by it. He was sickened at the sight of it. His reaction seems strikingly normal. What, your father never cut off anybody's pinky? The major narrative thread of the entire show flies in the face of Nussbaum's hypothesis. Tony is not a very good mob boss. He has the pedigree, he certainly has the charisma for it, but he lacks the coldness and brutality necessary to be successful. He seems to have a conscience. The focus of the show, his panic attacks and ensuing therapy sessions, suggest a certain sensitivity and vulnerability that's just not an asset to the leader of a criminal organization. 
One thing that Nussbaum is right about is that the central question to the entire show is, can Tony change? That question can be reduced to something more rudimentary, though. Who is Tony Soprano? Richard, Dr. Melfi's husband, thinks he knows. Man's a criminal, Jennifer. And after a while, finally, you're going to get beyond psychotherapy with its cheesy moral relativism. Finally, you're going to get to good and evil. And he's evil. Sure, Tony has done evil things, but does that make him inherently evil? Carl Jung, another depth psychologist, says that when it comes to evil, society focuses too much on what is done instead of asking itself exactly who is the doer. Again, who is Tony Soprano? Tony is large. He contains multitudes. Oddly, we learn more about who Tony is when he's being someone else. The Tony we meet in his coma dream represents Tony's unowned portions. His shadow is a successful entrepreneur, a self-made man. He's a good man, too, so good he can't even cheat on his wife. He's shocked by even the slightest show of violence. Despite how unique his subculture may be, the culture at large in which Tony lives is just regular Western culture, highly secularized and thus highly materialistic in the metaphysical sense of the word. Not surprisingly, he interprets his panic attacks in a purely physiological context. The fact that he seeks therapy because he wants his panic attacks to stop, not as a pitched campaign for self-development, hardly makes Tony unique among therapy patients. He simply wants relief. Dr. Melfi, however, is a depth psychologist, seemingly of the Freudian persuasion, and practices a form of psychology that is not only becoming increasingly rare in the 21st century, but one that hews closer to the true meaning of the term. She sees the practice as one that should promote higher awareness, greater self-efficacy, and noble ethics. She sets about putting Tony on this path. A psychologist is one who studies the soul. The ancient Egyptians postulated seven souls. Top soul and the first to leave. The depiction of panic attacks in the show has been criticized for being unrealistic. It's true. They're made to look like dying. At first it felt like ginger ale in my skull. Dr. Melfi indeed sees them as a spiritual crisis, if you will, as a matter of the soul. In doing so, she's implicitly acknowledging the very nature of the word panic. It comes from the Greek god Pan. After all, panic is something that one might do when faced with the divine. Tony was probably killed by the New York family. Examine the escalation of that conflict, and it's obvious that Tony's conscience played a significant role. For example, Tony showed a willingness to forgive Vito. Everything all right? You tell us. I'm good. Tell Tony I'll call him. It's better you come in. Yeah, Vito was a good earner, and also protecting him was a power move to keep the New York crew in its place. There was something more, though. Tony didn't want to see Vito hurt, especially since Vito's crime was hardly a crime at all. It was all a bit unfair, and Tony obviously knew, as we eventually found out, that the New York crew would brutalize Vito were they to get their hands on him. Lying piece of shit! Better not come around here no more! A similar situation unfolded with Tony's cousin. Tony Uncle Al acted rashly, killing Phil's brother out of revenge for what did appear to be a senseless killing. Phil was incensed. Initially defiant, Tony eventually understood that his cousin's death was inevitable. A tactful mob boss would have given the man up. He had broken the code, plain and simple. But when Tony couldn't secure a promise from Phil that his cousin wouldn't be tortured, Tony killed his cousin out of mercy. Tony knew that New York would have gotten to his cousin eventually, and they would not have been kind. Any chance for peace with New York was now lost as Tony robbed Phil of the satisfaction he so desperately sought. What? Didn't solve a thing. It's open, John. The fuck it is. He's beside himself now. Examples of Tony's lack of necessary brutality abound in the show. Despite appearances, Paulie was a disloyal opportunist. 
He even makes an offer to Johnny Sack to kill Tony. Tony was right about Polly being a leaky faucet and probably should have killed him on the boat when he had the chance. An effective mob boss would have. Come on, you told John about that joke, right? It wasn't me, Tom. No? That's right. Tony also probably should have had Patsy killed when he had Patsy's twin brother killed. Tony had to know that Patsy would know that Tony ordered the hit. Why risk making another enemy who stood so close to you? The real truth is that Nussbaum, just like Dr. Melfi, fell for an even greater con. It's the one where you trick yourself into thinking that you are good by projecting your darkness on another. Dr. Melfi ultimately subscribes to the notion that Tony is a psychopath. In doing so, she is both unencumbered of any responsibility to further help Tony, as well as freed from having to face her own darkness. That's not to say that Dr. Melfi never helped Tony, or that her intentions weren't noble. We see several occasions where Tony has sincere revelations of self-discovery, and times when he tries to make better choices. I didn't hurt nobody. Dr. Melfi also used him. During one of her sessions with her own therapist, Elliot, he notices that she's gained weight after having stopped seeing Tony. Elliot warns Dr. Melfi. What are you driving at? Just watch your intake of sugar and sugar substitutes. Okay. She understood Elliot's understatement. She was getting high off of her sessions with Tony feeling all of the thrills that come with defying society's basic notions of goodness without bearing any of the consequences of doing so. Interestingly, this is something you can arguably say about the average TV viewer. Who killed Tony, assuming he really did get whacked in that last moment? Anyone in the diner could have done it. The cops, the black dudes, even Meadow, at least inadvertently. The most logical chain of events is that Meadow innocently told her boyfriend, Patsy's son, where she was going that evening. He told his father, and his father told the New York crew, of whom the guy sitting at the bar in the members only jacket was a member. We were probably supposed to think it's Patsy, but then Patsy is only a Patsy, a fall guy. So who then? Honestly, the best candidate is Tony himself, or rather his own goodness. Tony is in the opposite position as most people, who must suppress their negative tendencies. Tony has to suppress his goodness because he lives in a subculture in which goodness is antithetical to survival. If he disavowed his evil ways and embraced his angelic nature, what would happen? When he kills Ralphie, who was arguably the most depraved character in the show, Tony has to lie about it, both to himself and to others. It was a fucking horse! It was about the horse, not about the stripper which makes it about money. That's something his culture can understand and accept. Maybe Dr. Melfi isn't directly responsible. After her rape, she had a dream that she was in her office and it was empty. She enters a door labeled high voltage, which puts her back in her office, but now there are things in there representing dangerous truths. She gets her arm stuck in a Coke machine, an allusion to her using Tony for a cheap thrill. Her rapist appears, but gets attacked by a Rottweiler. She discusses the dream with Elliot, and it's clear that she's missed the whole message. Elliot explicitly tells her what the dog represents. The forbidden part of your psyche. Murderous rage. And yet she immediately proceeds to project that evil onto Tony. Oh my God, the dog. What? A Rottweiler, Elliot. Big head, massive shoulders direct descendant of the dog used by the Roman armies to guard their camps. I didn't know that. And digging. Who do I dig with and who's dangerous? Who could I sick on that son of a bitch to tear him to shreds? Melfi used Tony and then washed her hands of him. She failed, as many therapists and psychologists fail, by refusing to take her own medicine. Guiding another person in the process of self-development always at some point means being called to it yourself. Melfi may very well be a hypocrite. Asking Tony to look in the mirror, a tall order for a man who's made a lot of grave mistakes, but when he becomes a mirror for her own darkness, 
we don't see her having any revelations. Carl Jung wrote, During the process of treatment, the dialectical discussion leads logically to a meeting between the patient and his shadow, that dark half of the psyche which we invariably get rid of by means of projection, by burdening our neighbors in a wider or narrower sense with all of the faults we invariably have ourselves. That's true even when our neighbors are our therapeutic patients, and even when they're staring back at us from the television screen. In her essay about the show in New York Magazine, Emily Nussbaum claims that the intention of David Chase and their writers was to reveal to the viewer that he or she is a bad person. She's right, but that's as much an endgame for the viewer of the show as it is for someone getting psychotherapy. Here, in consuming an artistic television program, just like there on the psychoanalytic couch, discovering one's shadow is a part of a process. Dr. Melfi found a way out. And by identifying with Melfi, it sounds like Nussbaum found her escape too. That leaves a question though. Until they have their own revelations, who will they project their shadows on next? The last episode is not called Born in America. It's called Made in America. Of course, it's a play on words because wise guys get made. Maybe it alludes to something else though. How does any criminal get created? How does criminality and criminal culture continue to thrive in the culture at large? What has prevented our culture from ever developing a widespread, effective approach to helping criminals? Without ever robbing the criminal, him or herself, of volition and choice, it can be good people that help to perpetuate criminality in a society by their endless appetite for scapegoats. In order to remain good, people need somewhere to cast their shadow. In the course of telling the story of Tony Soprano, is David Chase revealing something about the very nature of the urge to watch something like The Sopranos in the first place? As you watch the show, there are a lot of doors you can take. Take the simplest route and you end up with the tragic and comical story of a mob boss who struggles to succeed at a job while he negotiates the mundanity of life. Take another route and you end up at yourself, staring at a black screen, a mirror for your own darkness. David Chase said that he had wanted the last shot, the black screen, to go on all the way to the HBO logo, without credits. Maybe that was his way of preventing escape, of giving the viewer a chance to triumph where Dr. Melfi failed. Is it light where you are yet? <laughs>